Hello and welcome once again to Crazy Comics and Stories. It's me, your charming and delightful old Uncle Rap Bastard. And at the other end of the series of tubes and wires that we call the internets is Joe, Crazy Writer. How you doing today, Joe? It's gone. All gone. Uh, what's gone? Well, the snow. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Nope, they stacked it up in my yard. It's still about two feet. There's still a. Well, that as you live about three feet below pickle level. You know, we in my yard, it's gone. Actually, Last I... week we were talking about snow and telling about all the adventures we had in it, and this week, nope, melting away because it hit 72 today. I drove by the uh, Eden Prairie Mall, and you know, with malls, they just take all the snow and stack it in one part of the the parking lot. <laughs> oh, it's still there. It's still you know like twice as tall as a human being. It'll be, I re, there was one year where I remember it was there till June because we'd got yeah. so much snow. They'd stacked it up so high. <laughs> they do that in uh, Duluth. In fact, they're usually like mid-August, it finally melts away because <laughs> it gets that black layer of grit on yes. top of it and it won't go away. So, but yeah, no, I actually have a yard. I see grass. All we need is a little rain to get rid of the, the the sand that we tend to put on top of all the ice, and then a little uh, thunderstorm to get a little nitrates in the air and let everything start growing. Well, it, so, it's pretty soon I'll be able to go hiking again. Yeah, and then it'll snow next week. So. Well, yeah, because I, I will cause that. Yes. But uh, we, last week we were talking about the, uh, the uh, TV shows. The superhero we TV shows. And by the time this episode comes out, the Avengers movie has dropped. Yep. And uh, do you have your tickets yet? My wife bought tickets for me and my daughters. We're going Friday night. And she is not going, correct? Nope, she is going. Oh, really? I thought, you know, you she bought tickets for you and the daughters. So it's like, good, it's a night there. I don't have to put up with yep. these jerks. What was that? She's in the other room yelling, so suck it. No, suck it, Strode. You don't get to go with us. Yeah, suck it, Strode. We will abandon you. And we're going to eat pie just to spite you. <sighs> There's Not that really. sad you... music again. Usually I have pretzels, so don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to wait and see it on free comic book day, I think. Yep. I, I want to see it quick because, I mean, you figure it's, what, 10 years? Culmination of all the Marvel films. And isn't it like three hours long? I've heard it's three hours long. I have no idea. A three-hour tour. I I plan not to drink a lot of anything, but uh, I do definitely want to see it because I know there's always going to be some asshole. Oh, I can't believe that Thanos killed the uh, Pepper Potts. You know, it's like whatever, dude. Just shut up. <laughs> I can't believe that Thanos killed Rick Grimes. Yeah. And Batman. Freak. And Mickey showed up and saved the day. Mickey? Yeah, that mouse guy. <laughs> well, one character we know will be uh, won't be killed in the movie is uh, Ant-Man. Because he's got a movie that comes out right after. You can follow the Vegas uh, odd makers. I mean, they figure uh, the, the, the odds are good on Iron Man, Captain America, and Thor dying. Especially after the last movie of Thor. Which my wife finally watched, Thor Ragnarok. So... And uh, much of, she greatly appreciated uh, Chris walking around without a shirt on for a while, and uh, and yeah, all that stuff. So, but the, and then of course there's the odd makers. That they're like, okay, Spider Man, Ant Man, Doctor Strange, Black Panther, pff, not even on the list because they have movies coming out. That's so. right. And I'm like, really? This is what you're betting on? That's right. I suppose WrestleMania is over. Baseball's just starting, and who, you know. I think basketball. Is basketball going on? I don't yeah. even know. Yeah, they're in the playoffs. The Timberwolves. The Minnesota Timberwolves are in the playoffs. I think they're out already Damn by it. the time this airs. Yeah. But, uh, and and when we get to geeking, I'll be talking about how we get WrestleMania Part 2 over the weekend. Ooh. But uh, we promised the people a few things, Joe. We did. The first thing we promised them, you asked, at what point... Will this podcast catch up with Amazing Spider-Man, which hits issue 800 very soon? So I did the math. 
He's a math maker. And uh, when we hit episode 950, the amaz- and if Amazing Spider-Man stays monthly, we will catch up with Amazing Spider-Man. So I thought it was cats up. 950. And if they go bi-monthly, we'll catch Which up. Which they'll probably do. Well, then we'll catch up with episode 1,150. So we got that going for us. So you need to, you know, get healthy, go to the gym, take care of yourself. Who's this gym guy you keep telling me about? He's a guy who will help you get healthy. Ah, so I take it Pop-Tarts and Kool-Aid is not, oh, this is not the way to get healthy. Well, it depends. What are you putting in the Kool-Aid to make it sweet? Nothing. I, I want aspartame. Ah, then, you know, that's better than sugar. Ah, honey, honey. Ah. But uh, the second thing. Second. There's more than one. Are you talking about MSP Comic Con 2018? May 18th. I'm sorry. May 19th and 20th. 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Saturday. 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Sunday. At the Minnesota State Fairgrounds. In the grandest stand of them all. The uh, grandstand. And you can go to mcbacomiccons.com. And get advanced tickets right now. And all the information and the guests and things like that. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Oh, okay. That, uh, that was a, a sidebar, I guess. Ah. No, uh, we talked a couple of weeks ago about how Marvel was having their their collections and trade paperbacks being sold on Comicology and Amazon at ninety nine cents the week of release. Bah! They have stopped that practice. Wah, wah, wah. So we will probably never know the story behind it, but it has stopped. For now, yeah, it could come back at any time. Probably. Are you out of your blanket mind? You never know. You don't. You just never know. So uh, the last thing to follow up on that I can remember, because Lord knows we've done 352 of these damn things. We probably have like 5,000 things that we said that we would talk about and never got around to. Yep. Yo, we'd know. If somebody would put together a Wikipedia page, but no, no, slackers have not made a Wikipedia page, and that upsets me because we are a national treasure to be sold off to pay off the national debt. I don't think we'll get that much. Yeah, that's true. I, I, I really don't think we'd even be able to pay for one of Trump's school toilets if they sold us. Hmm. But uh, we we said that we would talk about our five favorite superheroes slash comic book related movies this week. So go ahead. Tell me what your twist is. Tell me how you're going to muck with the formula. Tell me how you're going to take this idea and twist it to your own evil ways. Go ahead, Joe. It's the same. The same thing as last week. So for those of you who have the podcast, go ahead and listen to it last week. And uh, in the meantime, you know, we'll just let Stroh try to figure it out. I didn't listen to last week's podcast. Yeah, I didn't either. I was and I was here. No, for me, it was the top five movies that absolutely wowed me, knocked my socks off, made me go, oh, sweet bejesus, they got it right. And number one is the 1989 film, I'm Batman. Of course, Tim Burton did it. Uh, it was the debut of Michael Keaton as Bruce Wayne slash Batman and Jack Nicholson as Joker. Uh, there was a lot of other key players, Kim Basinger, Robert Wool, Pat Hingle, Billy D. Williams, and they never followed up with him, unfortunately. Because, uh, you know, we're all like, oh, that's, uh, uh, what's his name? Dent. Harvey He's Dent. Gonna be, he's going to be Two-Face. No, isn't he? He's just like the last Jedi. They're going to show him no love. He's just gone. And, uh, the sheer awesomeness of the movie was, you know, it starts out in the opening scenes very cool because up until then, everybody was worried about campy Batman. And, you know, we talked about our love of the Batman TV show, but really in the 70s and 80s, Meaty was locked into this bam, pow, biff. Anytime they talked about comics or comic book movies, they had to go reach back and be so oh original and just use those those cool sound effects from the Batman TV show. Well by the time they got to the Batman movie, they took 
they they took it away. They, I mean, we had known Batman had been a serious character since Neil Adams got a hold of him in the seventies, but it just public consciousness never caught up with that. And this movie, I think, single handedly turned the brain trust to the fact that hey, Batman's not a campy character. He's he could be serious. You know, there were there were some light moments in it, but it was very much influenced by uh, you know Alan Moore, Brian Bolin, Frank Miller the work that they did on Batman. And it, it was a, a critical success, a financial success. It was outstanding to see it in the theater. I mean, everybody, you know, and again, this is something, you know, I listen to people piss and moan about, oh my God, I can't believe they made Doctor Who a woman. Oh my God, I can't believe they made Lost in Space without uh, Bill Mummy. Oh my God, you know, Oh my God! I can't believe they're doing Discovery before Kirk and oh, new new Spock and no, dude. We listen to everybody piss and moan when Michael Keaton was called in to be Batman. What, Mr. Mom is going to be Batman? He's and it's directed great... by the guy who did Pee Wee, Pee Wee Herman's movie. Yeah. Oh, and you know it turned out awesome. Matter of fact, people by the time this movie series was done were going, oh, I want Michael Keaton back, and. uh if you're really looking for, I mean, first of all, this kind of set the theme for the Batman movies where the villains pretty much steal the show. And if the only complaint I really have is uh, towards the end, there's a couple of dumbass scenes where, you know, Batman's trying hard to take out the Joker with his guns and apparently misses, but, you know, Joker can pull out a big ass wazoo gun and just shoot the thing out of the sky. Although Jack Nicholson did, did play kind of a surprise. Uh, just a phenomenal movie. It just wowed me to no end. It showed that, yes, you can have a serious Batman. Not a tremendous amount of CGI involved. And, uh, you know, it gave an awesome Batmobile. Uh, the Batwing was cool. And, you know, it took a long time to, till Heath Ledger to uh, people to get Jack Nicholson out of their mind. And, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of ignoring Mac, Mark Hamill doing uh, Joker on the animated show. But, again, the animated show didn't have quite the – the, uh, uh, I don't know, wide appeal that Batman had. And, of course, Corey knows that's not even worth a dime who did all the uh, the music for Batman. Uh, Oingo Boingo. And? No, Danny Elfman, the guy from and? Oingo Boingo. And he did the soundtrack, but Prince threw in a bunch of new songs. Yeah, and, and it was we actually... we have talked in the past simple... about how I knew that before everybody else on the planet. A sing there was actually a single album that was all Prince songs, and it was just fantastic. Money, money, money! <laughs> so that was that's number one in on my list. Uh, my first movie is also a Batman movie, but it's a different one. Batman, and I'm just going with my five favorites, and that is The Dark Knight. Um, The Dark Knight holds up. I remember when. Uh, the Batman franchise had kind of run itself into the ground and it needed to be reinvented. And this was before everything was getting rebooted all the time. So that when Batman Begins came out, it was kind of, oh, okay, whatever. I didn't even rush to go see it. I saw it till like a couple of weeks later when I heard that it was okay. And Batman Begins blew me away. It was excellent. It was what I wanted in a Batman movie. You know, the Tim Burton Batman, while it was, you know, light years ahead of what people expected, when you go back and watch it now, there's still parts that are kind of goofy. You go back, you watch Batman Begins, and there's nothing goofy in it. It's very well done, but Dark Knight was an excellent movie. Take out the fact that it's Batman, and it's still a phenomenal movie. Um... It's one that I could watch over and over and over and never get tired of. And in a lot of ways, other than the Batman animated series, this is my favorite version of Batman. Um, I remember when it came out, I was working at a movie theater, and even us employees weren't able to see it for a week or two because it was sold out all the time. It was always sold out. So that when I did finally see it, it was on like a Saturday afternoon early show. 
and still the theater was packed. There was an energy to that movie that I haven't seen in another movie in a long time. And um, I recently picked up the Blu-ray of all three of the, uh, the Christopher Nolan Batman movies. So I'm excited to see them on Blu-ray and all the extras and all the special stuff. And now I have a digital copy, too. Ooh. Joe? The next one that wowed me to the point of I felt like my 12-year-old self picking up that first Spider-Man comic was the Spider-Man 2002 film that Sam uh, Raimi, Raimi. Raimi, he directed it. It was Tobey Maguire as Peter Parker and the Kristen Dunst as Mary Jane Watson. Oh, my. I didn't even mind William Dafoe's goofy Norm Osborn costume. You know, really, you take a guy like William Dafoe, who is amazing. Willem, I guess. Uh, <laughs> You're being correct. I am. I am. But and what do you do? You put him in a Power Ranger Green Goblin mask. I mean, come on. Really? Other than that, what wowed me on this one was the fact that now CGI had finally caught up. And we actually could see Spider-Man flying through the air in New York. I mean, we saw another, another, you know, I'll jump forward to Spider-Man 2 a little bit because uh, that was an awesome movie, too. Uh, one of my favorite scenes was just in the uh, trailer where they, they kind of go from the ground floor and then you catch Dr. Octopus as he's climbing a building and you, you zoom all the way up and there's Spider-Man on top of the building. And you get kind of a scale to just how these guys do it, which comics don't always cover. But you... With the Spider-Man 2002 film, it was just, it was like everything we've been waiting for. All these years we've been promised uh, Spider-Man, and it just never happened. It never materialized. You know, we had that goofy TV show in the 70s that just didn't work. And finally, it it, it was there. What, what I didn't like about the film, of course, is, and it probably because the way uh, McGuire looked, is they kind of blew over the, all the high school stuff and just got him into uh, adulthood right away, but it still worked out pretty good. And, you know, just, I could watch the scenes of him swinging through New York over and over. Uh, the scene where, when uh, Green Goblin attacks and everybody's screaming and he's just standing there looking up, like getting ready to go. And, uh, the fight scenes were amazing. Uh, Spider-Man two built up on it. I, uh, I don't think they ever did a Spider-Man three, but, uh, it was just a, an amazing film, a realization of what I've always wanted to see since I was a kid. And, uh, you know, again, I, I like the, the current Spider-Man. I never did watch the uh, the reboot. I, I've never seen those. And I heard they're okay. It's just uh, – and maybe I'll watch them eventually one of these days. But the, the first one for me was always have a – has a, a special place because it finally – finally could see Spider-Man swinging through the New York skyline. And even when I was there, you know, I mean, it's a geek thing when you're in New York and you're thinking, you just kind of look up and like, yeah, I could see this happening. <laughs> Although really for as fast as he swings through the air, he'd cover Manhattan in about five minutes. So, uh, and of course there is the, the infamous scene that once you've seen, you can never unsee. Corey, do you know what I'm talking about? The um, Spider-Man kissing Mary Jane upside down in the rain? Nope. Worse. I don't know. When Spider-Man saves Mary Jane the first time and is swinging off into him, there's a scene where she is holding on to him and just kind of looks at him. It's not Toby. It's a dummy. She's holding a dummy. And it was as many times as you see that, you will never unsee it now that I ruined it for you. It's just one of those scenes. That it's like the in American Sniper. They didn't use a real baby. They used a baby doll as he's sitting there holding his kid. And it's like, no, that scene just doesn't work. So other than, you know, Willem Dafoe was awesome. Uh, it did a good setup for the future. I actually bought uh, Rosemary Harris as Aunt May, even though I do like the younger, hotter Aunt May. And, of course, Cliss Robertson. It, it was the, the, the origin story that, thank God, we'll never have to see redone. Because, you know, face it, Uncle Ben, you're just not long for this world. You're a great rice, but you're a lousy uncle. Uh, hey, Joe. Yes? What's brown and curls up your leg? 
Uh, tarantula? Uncle Ben's perverted rice. I miss okay. Perverted. I do, too. I was waiting for them, and they just weren't there. Corey, what's your next film? Uh, the next movie I have on my list is a one of the Marvel movies. There have been a lot of Marvel movies, and I enjoy all of them. Yes, all of them, even Ant-Man. But the one that I've enjoyed the most so far is Captain America Civil War. It showed that you can have a whole bunch of characters and still have a compelling story. It actually, uh, I like the, uh, the setup in this one better than I did the comic book version of Civil War because it wasn't as uh, uh, bullshit. <laughs> And the characters all had reasons for what they did. And, you know, you just, so many exciting things happened. Black Panther showed up. Spider-Man showed up. Giant Man showed up. It, it was just, it was like a comic book come to life. It was incredibly well done, very tense, um, and very tight. There weren't any scenes where you were just kind of, Sitting back going, oh, I'm so tired of this exposition. Can we just move on? Nope. This th I remember when we saw it, it was one of those movies where you come out when it wraps up and you go, wait a minute. It can't be over yet. Oh, wow. We've been here for two and a half hours. Just a perfect roller coaster action movie with a lot of heart and a lot of, uh, lot of plot behind what was going on, too. It wasn't just a mindless slugfest. There were ideas in this film. And out of all the Marvel movies, it's my favorite. Joe? Even though Zemo's plan was incredibly convoluted, and if any one thing would have changed, it never would have happened. That was about, And that's one of those things where, you know, you don't grab a roller coaster and pick it apart. You know, and, and that really, if you start looking at the, the whole thing with Zemo's plan, it was such a coincidence that everything fell together. Did not care, though, when I saw the movie. Fantastic. I didn't choose that one, though. Uh, I had a, a tough time trying to figure out which ones to do. I didn't know if I wanted to do the first Iron Man because, again, a movie that just, wow, this is so cool. And, of course, when uh, Nick Fury shows up at the end and wants to talk about the... Avengers, Avengers initiative. initiative. You know, every fanboy in the theater went. <laughs> I went with Guardians of the Galaxy, though, the first one. Another movie similar like what you're saying. It just starts off fun. It's goofy. The, the, I almost hear the 70s music playing in my head. Hey, ho, what you want? And he's kicking those dumbass things across the planet. Uh, it was fun. I, I, I loved watching Dave Bautista. Uh, because, you know, we watched him as a pro wrestler, but to see him actually acting was was a lot of fun. And, you know, everything went together well. I enjoyed the second one almost as much as the first one. And it's one of those movies that, is, as I'm watching it, you almost hate to see it end because I genuinely like these characters. I could have I could handle like a five-hour movie with these guys just sitting around as Rocket Raccoon trying to grab I, – I need that guy's leg. No, just because <laughs> I, I need his leg. And – you know, there's just it's just one of those things where you, you love the characters mesh, they go together well, and I could just, you know, two and a half hours is long enough. Let's do a four hour movie, and uh, and it wowed me. I mean, it showed that yeah, a Marvel movie doesn't have to be grim and gritty like you know Civil War. You know, they always have their little moments, but it was a pretty serious movie with some serious repercussions on it. Uh, Thor Ragnarok was in a similar vein to Guardians of the Galaxy, just kind of lighthearted. But it had its serious moments. And I just, uh, for Guardians of the Galaxy, it was just awesome. I mean, I hope they just let these guys have a seven-movie deal and just keep going with it. And the fact that they're in the upcoming of uh, Avengers uh, movie, I, I mean, it, it's like, oh, we're going to see them sooner than later. So, plus the, the Easter eggs were just fun, you know. Yeah, you know, Howard the Duck at the end. <laughs> And I didn't even pick on Howard the Duck because I love Leia Thompson, you know. But <laughs> anyways, that's that's my pick. What do you got next, Corey? Uh, the next movie is probably one of my favorite movies of all time, and that is Scott Pilgrim versus the World. This was not a comic that I read before I heard about the movie. 
because it was being published in little trade paperbacks from Oni Press, and it was getting, you know, it was uh, American manga, and it wasn't in my wheelhouse. It wasn't something where I'd heard that, you know, I would like it. So when they announced the movie and the people involved, it was, oh, okay, well, this could be interesting. I might as well read the comic. And I loved the comic. I devoured that thing. And I think the last one came out like right before the movie. Because I know when they were filming the movie, they had to ask um, the creator, how does the story end? Because he hadn't completed the ending yet. But Scott Pilgrim vs. the World is very much a comic book on the screen. It's a love affair to the comic. It's a love affair to video games. Beautifully filmed. So much fun to watch. And, like, you know, a lot of movies that are very, you know, big on Flash, they don't age well. I recently saw it. It was on cable while I was at the group home, and I recently watched it. And it holds up perfectly. It's still fun. It may be one of the best, you know, teenage drop, you know, teenage movies of the last 20 years, even without the comic book connection. Um, the characters are all bright and exciting and interesting. The humor is very well done. Um, you can see, you know, I like I said, I've seen it a whole bunch of times. I still laugh at the punchlines. I still love the jokes. Uh, it, I have so much fun watching this movie, and I think that's one of the things about when you talked about Guardians of the Galaxy, I saw Scott Pilgrim in the theater a few times because it was just such a fun ride to watch. And still, every so often, if I don't want to watch the whole movie, I'll pull up one of the different fights and watch that on YouTube. So uh, I love Scott Pilgrim. Absolutely love that movie. Joe? This next one I had to think about because I wasn't quite sure if I wanted to consider it a superhero movie. Is it a fantasy movie? Is it a Star Wars movie? I, I just I had to go with the original Star Wars before New Hope, before remade, before Blu-ray. What I saw in the theater as a twelve-year-old kid, and this to me was again I I just started reading comics. Uh, one of the comics I actually uh, bought and read before I saw the movie was Star Wars uh, number four, I believe it is. Yeah, when I, I think all six slapped. parts were out before the movie came out. Yeah, and my cousin was like, don't read it, and I read it. And, you know, I have the comic in a 2.0 condition because, you know, I bought it up at Ely, Minnesota at an actual comic book uh, newsstand, which, you know, is they don't even exist anymore. And uh, so I, I, I slabbed it mostly for the uh, sentimental reasons. But, boy, I remember seeing the first ads for Star Wars thinking, meh. And then I started seeing stills for it. And it was kind of like, it was kind of cool. You got a human and this big fuzzy thing. And those are obviously robots. And I'm not sure what this Vader thing is. Have you gone back I, and watched the original trailer? Yeah, I have. It is terrible. Oh, the 70s trailers were terrible. But I watched the trailer recently because I don't remember ever seeing a trailer for it. And I watched it and it was like, that would have kept me away from the theater. I'm pretty sure I didn't see it because I didn't really get to see a lot of movies unless I did it on my own. But Star Wars, again, I, I probably saw it a couple weeks in and everybody was raving about it. And oh my God, that first hit, that first note. Blew me out of my seat, and I was just wowed. I mean, you'd ne we'd never seen anything like this on the screen before. You know, science fiction up until then was kind of, uh, how would you say, like Logan's Run, Soylent Green, 2001, The Space Cluster. Uh, just yeah, the real and the Apes movies and stuff like that. Yeah, and what they did is they cut the budget on every sequel. They didn't do that in Star Wars. If anything, they increased it, and... We just we couldn't wait for the next movie, and it was just so mind blowing. The villains, the uh, the heroes, you know, you had uh, Princess Leia, Carrie Fisher, you know, was hot, uh, uh, and Han Solo. He shot first because he was the rascal of the group. He, that instantly 
made him the badass of the group, the fact that he blew Greedo away. And, you know, I know Lucas wants to recon it for whatever weird brain cells are rubbing together in his head. But damn it, that's not the Star Wars. That told us right away Han Solo was the cool kid. He's the one all of us wanted to be as 12-year-old kids. Yeah, Mark Hamill got the funky thing and he got to kiss his sister. Uh, no, it wasn't his sister. He got to kiss the princess at the time. Later was coming. Uh, Peter Cousing was just, oh, evil. And Vader was just weird. I mean, you look at some of the things in that movie and you, you wonder, how did, how did uh, Grand Moff Tarkin get to be, he commanded Vader to do shit. Nobody commanded Vader after that. Uh you know, there's there's things that, that don't hold up pretty well. I mean, just how badass was Princess Leia? Yeah, she just watched her whole planet blow up. Invaders. Uh, meanwhile, Luke's like, oh man, uh, I watched. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, he he died. It's like, oh my god. There's just, but it didn't matter because it was just incredible. Everything was big. It was bigger than life. I I can't rave enough about it because even now, just thinking about the original one, and. You know, I guess that's why I get so flummoxed about people bitching about Star Wars now. You know, oh, man, I don't like it now. It's like, it's your choice. No Star Wars or this. And there's so much more to that universe. I, I trust Disney to franchise it. I'm looking forward to the solo film. Uh, yeah, there's always something you can pick at. <clears throat> Jar Jar, midichlorians. But, you know, there's so much more that they could do with it. And I'm just, I'm just happy... Here I am. I mean, good Lord, 77, 87, 97, 2007, 2000. We're over 40 years, and I'm still gawking about this particular movie. And uh, to me, it really captured, you know, I, again, we're talking superhero movies. But, man, there are a lot of superhero stuffs in there. I mean, Vader's a really badass guy at the time. And, you know, you, Luke got the fancy powers. He got to swing the cool lightsaber. You just had a little bit of everything in there. And, uh, yeah, we ran around most of that winter and summer, you know. Well, even to this day, I can't walk through uh, Target without picking up a uh, uh, tube of wrapping paper and fight. <laughs> Which is why I'm not allowed in Target anymore. But So, I, yeah, I'm going to go with Star Wars for uh, for my fourth one there. One of the things that I think is interesting that people nowadays – there's no comprehension of this, but they put out the comic as promotion for the movie because they were like, oh, man, this is going to be hard. So maybe if we get these comic book people to think it's a comic book movie, they'll come. Well, and, and yeah, and people didn't even uh, I mean, the, the story is legendary that everybody passed on it. And even Fox was like, yeah, George, you keep the rights to it. Uh, we'll distribute it for you. Uh huh. The other thing, though, was the release. Now when a Star Wars movie comes out, it's in all the theaters and you can see it first week. I lived outside a town of 350 people. The closest movie theater was in Canton, Illinois, which was about, I'm trying to think, about 15 miles away. The movie came out, uh, what, Memorial Day weekend? Yeah. It didn't come to Canton until the end of Jul of August. Because there weren't enough prints. The theaters were booked for other things. So you had to wait. And that's something that people don't understand anymore. Especially you know, by the time you got to um, Empire Strikes Back. That wasn't happening anymore. But when a big movie came out, you had to wait. I remember my parents had to wait for months to go see The Godfather. Because it would play in the big cities, and then it would play in the medium cities, and then finally it would play in the smaller cities. Months later. In Peoria, it played in one theater for an entire year. My daughters are so tired of me saying that. I said, you don't understand. To see Star Wars, you had one choice. Go to the theater. I saw Star Wars, I think, six times. Uh, I remember the news making it where one guy saw it one day. He saw it 100 days in a row. And after that, the theater just let him in for free, mainly because he's probably buying tons of popcorn and stuff. But, <laughs> you, know, you know, nowadays it's like, well, if I don't see it, it'll be out. On, it'll be streaming in a few weeks. It might be at Redbox. I mean, you know, I saw Thor Ragnarok 
when it came out, my wife finally, you know, she didn't want to see it, but then we finally got it off Redbox. You have so many more options. You don't have to wait. And that's assuming you're not into the, you know, pirate bullshit where you just download it. The other thing, if you really want to know the, the effect Star Wars had, go look on Netflix, look up the series, The Toys That Made Us, and look at the first episode about Star Wars. They didn't have the toys ready, I believe, until an entire year after the movie came out. Yeah. And they still sold like crazy. The infamous promise envelope where you will get the first run production. And for, you know, people scoffed at that. But, man, if you had that original tray, it was like a, like those Lunchables where you peel off the thing and you get the toys out of it. That baby's a serious collector's item. The The original envelope, unopened, unredeemed, it was a, a expensive collector item. And then somebody found a warehouse full of them. But the price has since crept up. All those early Star Wars things that came out. Uh, just go check the film out and you'll see just how Kenner went from like a, a small toy company and just blew up overnight to uh, an incredible, incredible toy company. And then they eventually got swallowed up for other things. But it, Star Wars was such a, a weird phenomena. I don't think it'll ever – I mean, there were big moments in Star Wars again. I mean, for comic readers, when Dark Horse decided to come out with uh, Dark Jedi. Dark Empire. Oh, Empire, thank you. I mean, that sold like crazy. And then when Lucas redid uh, the reimagined uh, – and on set first. I mean, everybody's like, oh, that's stupid. It's never going to make money. Lucas made another billion dollars on that. And now you see, oh, 40th anniversary of Greece, 40th anniversary of Ghostbusters. Let's re-release it in the theater. I mean, you remember the ad for that for a generation. They've only seen it this way. And they show the small screen as the uh, tie, or the, the X-Wing comes at you and it hits the screen and explodes. And it's like, come see it. And I remember taking uh, Dana to go see it because she'd never seen it in the theater. And then, of course, when uh, we were all excited for uh, what was that? What was the next the prequel movie? I can't even remember it. I just remember standing in line at Toys R Us just to try to get a set of the toys, and we were all excited for that. And then we met Jar Jar and the Trade Federation. <laughs> but it still got us excited for uh, the Force Awakens. I mean, it was just something that kept going. <sighs> I can't even think of a franchise that's that way. Or can I? Corey, what you got next? Uh, the next movie is one that I think is, you know, I've talked about how Captain America Civil War was one of the most perfect Marvel movies. And Dark Knight was a great movie. I think Superman, the motion picture, the more I read about the behind the scenes stuff, the more I'm amazed that the movie is as good as it is. Because of many of the people involved in making it, just terrible, terrible people. Um, the original script by Mario Puzo was thrown out and not used. <laughs> they paid him a lot of money for that script. Didn't use it. Um, the Salkinds, <laughs> the, you know, they filmed one and two together and then threw out most of what they had filmed for two. But you go back and you watch that movie. Christopher Reeve is... Clark Kent and Superman. It is probably the best casting of any superhero movie. Um, I recently read a interview with uh, John Byrne where he said, I never saw a problem with the Clark Kent secret identity after I watched Christopher Reeve and Superman the motion picture. He made, he made me understand how putting on the glasses and changing how you act can make you seem like a completely different person. There are campy moments in it. There are silly moments in it. But anytime Christopher Reeve is on that screen, that is a excellent knock-your-socks-off movie. And to this day, I don't understand why that didn't kickstart kind of a superhero thing in movies. Because it was a huge financial hit. It was well done. It was loved by adults and kids. And it kind of always shows me that if you keep the heart of the character, people will love 
love the movie. The reason we don't like Man of Steel is because it's not the heart of the character. It's dark and it's gritty and it's Superman being told by Pa Kent that, no, you need to hide. People will, people will hate you. No, Pa Kent's the one who said, look, you're here for a reason. You're here for a purpose. There's an aspect of hope to the movie. There's the romance, the lines. So many lines in that movie are eminently quotable. Um, and how much of it is just because Christopher Reeve knew how to sell that movie. He knew how to sell the character. You watch it and you believe. The, I remember the, the trailer was, you will believe a man can fly. And coming out of that movie, you believe that Christopher Reeve is Superman. There was no other movie that he did. He was a great actor, and I've seen him in other films where he did a great job. But he was so good at Superman that that's all anybody ever wanted to see him as. Which, you know, kind of a curse. But hey, you know, you get four major motion pictures out of it, and you get paid more each time you show up. Yeah, you're going to cash that check. But Superman the Motion Picture, just a phenomenal movie that, and that was still during the era where if you mentioned Batman, people thought the TV series, Superman the Motion Picture showed that, treat it seriously, people will, people will go, people will like it. You don't have to camp it up, you don't have to be goofy about it, you don't have to treat it like it's a joke. Be reverent to the source material, and you'll get rewarded. Joe? Speaking of uh, franchises and sticking to the source material and just having a, a lot of fun and, and uh, a fanboy's wet dream, I'm going with The Avengers, the 2012 film, which is apropos because we got the, uh, the, the Infinity War right on top of us. Oh, man, this was just amazing. I mean, this is probably the last film, well, I suppose Guardians came afterwards, that I was like, oh, that was incredible. You almost hated to see the characters go their own way at the end because you just absolutely loved them. So up to, up to this point, uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, okay, we had, well, we had two Hulk movies. Uh, we had Iron Man, Captain America, and I, Thor, and then the Avengers, which was just brilliant. And the way it tied together, there were Easter eggs leading into each other, the the advent of the you know you don't leave a marvel movie until the very freaking end because you're going to miss something uh and just little seeds that go into other ones i mean there's there's people that did the timeline where they're talking about uh, like an iron man when uh is it uh phil goes off yeah we got something in uh, southwest in new mexico i got to deal with that was thor uh there's where they talk about an iron man at the time the movie was going on Hulk was rampaging in his second movie in San Francisco. Uh, there's Easter eggs all over the place. You know, there's Captain America's shield being made. Uh, and this, this movie was just a wow movie. And I did we, was this one of the first we saw on? Yes, it is. I still have my cup game? from when we yeah, saw it in uh, St. Cloud because they had the special collector cup. And I'm goofy. I will buy that stuff. It's like, oh, an oh, extra I dollar for a collector stuff. cup that uh, just basically a piece of plastic with pictures on it? Fuck yeah! I bought that <laughs> and I bought the uh, the, the tin uh, popcorn. And Bucket. what's amazing now is you've got everybody wants to make a franchise universe. I The way Marvel Studios did, the way Disney's inherited it, and they just, they're failing the one thing that made the movie work. The fact that every other movie, you know, be it they tried with the Hulk, Iron Man, Captain America, they're their own standalone type movies. You can go see a Thor movie and not necessarily care about what's going on in Avengers. You can see Doctor Strange and why I don't know you'd ever want to not see the Avengers, you would. Black Panther's the same way. They all tie in, but they all stand alone. Um, Civil War is almost Captain America. Civil War is almost like Avengers. Uh, Three. You know, yeah, and this shows just the power of the Marvel movies. Uh, we've talked podcasts long time ago about how. Oh, I can't think of his name. Ari, 
Arvid? Yeah. He gave away the X-Men movie rights in order to prove to the owner of Marvel at the time, Ron Perlman, that yes, we can make movies on this. And the X-Men movie was close to being on the list because, man, we were excited as hell for this. And it was a fun, good movie with its little bits and all the characterization was good. But Avengers was just – Avengers was done right. It was just all the pieces they locked together. I've got friends right now that are going through all 12, if not more, Marvel movies just waiting for Infinity War. But Avengers – I mean, as good as Avengers 2 was, and I, I, I may – Change my mind once we finally sit down and talk about Avenger War in a couple of weeks. But for me right now, Avengers was the last movie I was just wowed with. It was it was so good, so perfect. I mean, I want to throttle Marvel. Why didn't you make a Black Widow movie? Why don't you take uh, Jeremy Renier and make him a Hawkeye level character with the Netflix guys? You know, I, I don't agree with the decision. Well, the movie and the shield and the whatever, they're all going to be kind of in their own little universes where you, we know us fanboys know they're not. You know, they tried that with Vertigo, remember? We knew Vertigo was part of the DC universe, at least some of it was. You know, make the parts fit. You know, if, they're, if Avengers doesn't have a cameo with all the Netflix characters somewhere in the movie i think they they're 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 not doing themselves a solid but i I, you know i this is one of the movies i absolutely loved it wowed me it's the last one on my list that i'm going to babble on like a like an inherent idiot so let's jump over to Corey. what what is the last one on your list the last one on my list is actually close to one of the ones on your list spider-man one was great spider-man two was phenomenal They'd taken all the lessons they'd learned from the first Spider-Man movie and kicked it up a notch. They made it more interesting. They made the, they, you know, in the first one, they captured Peter Parker and Spider-Man. And in the second one, they, it's like in the first one, they were kind of in second and third gear. And in the second one, they jammed it into fourth gear and hit the gas. It's still, you know, another one of those movies. If I'm passing by and it's on FX, I'm watching. Um, for all of the crap Tobey Maguire get, got about uh, before he was Spider-Man, oh, he's too small, he's a little kid, he was oh. perfect as Spider-Man. And see, uh, see Michael Keaton slash Batman, you know, which is why I, you know, people, it's called acting. Let them act. Well, and don't hate on stuff before it comes out. Yeah. I don't even know what the latest movie is that people are hating before it comes out. Solo. Star Wars Solo. People are just hating it. There's another one, too. And, you know, they were complaining about the casting. And all I do now is I just cut and paste the picture somebody put up from the Comic Buyer's Guide back in 1988. Oh, I can't believe that Mr. Mom and Pee Wee Herman's (laughs) director are making a Batman movie. It's going to suck. Or go look up that song, you know, Batman starring Adam West, which actually wasn't a knock. It was just a, will there be budget blackbuster? Be a bat bomb? Well, Batfan cares that Batman is also Mr. Bomb. Tune in tomorrow to turn the rest. Although they should have let him have a cameo. Good Lord, you let Pee Wee Herman have a cameo. Well, I think one of the problem was that Adam West was uh, trying to pitch Dark Knight saying it was his own idea. It could be me. I would have made him Bruce Wayne's dad. Just have him gunned down in the alley. That'll teach ya. I wanted to be Batman when I grew up. My parents got tired of me dragging him down dark alleys. <laughs> no, not today, Scory. <laughs> but uh, Spider-Man 2, a lot of fun. Um, and it showed that Spider-Man wasn't just a one-off. That they finally figured out the formula to making Marvel movies right. Because and destroyed it with Spider-Man three. Oh, sorry. I don't. <laughs> I don't hate it. Spider-Man three as much as other people. I, I think don't either. A lot either. of the problems it with it was the crap that the studio said. Hey, fit in Venom. Fit in this. Fit in this. Yeah. And a lot of superhero movies, when they get to their third and fourth, they're cramming in too many villains. It's like, okay, well, in the first one we only had one villain. So in the second one we need to have two. And by the third one we need to have nine. No. Villain. 
it's why I like the, <laughs> like the fact that Marvel, they're not letting that bloat happen. Where, okay, uh, in this one, uh, we've had one villain. Now we're in uh, the fourth movie. Let's have a, an entire team of villains. Look back at the Avengers. The villain was Loki. Period. You know, he brought in the aliens and stuff, but it was Loki. That's it. That's all they needed. And I think I talked about it because I was on the road at the time when I saw Avengers. And when we saw Thanos, I was like, oh. <laughs> and everybody who was with me was a non-comic fan. What? What? What did I miss? What did I miss? I said, oh, I'll describe it later. But, man, that was crazy. And I really wish Sam Raimi would uh, get pulled back into superhero movies. I think Marvel would do themselves a solid by having him direct something. Is and they kind of hinted at one movie they want to do, and the minute I heard it, it's like, oh, oh, let Sam Raimi do it, because they're talking about Nova. Ooh. And if they do Nova, of course they're going to do the new young Nova, and he's, you know, he showed with Spider Man, he can do young superheroes type stuff. So, now not all of these movies are great, Joe. No, nope, they're definitely not. Uh, some of them. I'm looking at you, uh, Steel, Catwoman, the Punisher movies, all three of them. And Sam. Uh, the 1990 Captain America movie. Mm, Howard the Duck. Rat Finka Boo Boo. But I picked one. One to be the worst. One well, to I rule them all. I, I don't call it the worst. I was majorly disappointed with it. And it, the honor that goes to Superman Returns. 2006 superhero movie. I almost feel bad for Brandon Roth, who played Clark Kent slash Superman, because he did a really good Superman. Uh, the, the gist was is that for some ungodly reason, Superman went out into space for five years. And when he, he came back, that was the fun part of the movie. Because Superman's back. And no one believed it. You know, and the shots, like one guy takes a pot shot at Superman, just bounces off his eyeball, and we're like, ooh. But he was good, but the, the script was terrible. And again, I bought pretty much all the characters, including Kevin Spacey as Lex Luthor. But what really bothered me about it was at the end, they did not know how to end this movie. This wasn't a, I don't know if they, if they were thinking that, okay, this is going to be a relaunch of Superman or just a CUDA to the Christopher Reed three movies. This was of supposed which, to be a huge relaunch. Okay, well, they failed miserably because f the first thing is, is the movie ended kind of like, eh, you know, you're, I'm looking at the movie times like, okay, they got 20 minutes and they have Superman falling out of the sky after saving everybody, after being poisoned by, stabbed. By Luther with a kryptonite uh, type sword, or it was no, it was a sword. It was like a kryptonite shard. Yeah, crystal. And, and there were three things wrong with it. First of all, you don't bring a guy back and kill him off right away. Batman, Superman, I'm looking at you. And you don't. We never had the conclusion to Superman getting Luther. I mean, even in the other ones, at the end of the movie, Luther in Gene Wilder's bald-headed glory, was in jail. In this case, he just kind of, he stabbed Superman, he dropped something on, on uh, I don't even remember what he was dropping it, if it was, uh, he was doing that dumbass plan where he wants to, yeah, let's make more uh, real estate by blowing up half the California. But Luther just gets away scot-free. No, Superman should have showed up, and I'd been happy if he just, he was getting ready to punch Luther, and he just stopped and did the pink with his finky and grab him and drag him to jail. There was no, you know, again, maybe they were getting too clever for themselves thinking, okay, this will get people driving in for the second movie. But no, when they stop and they re they kind of drop the hint that, oh, yeah, Superman basically banged Lois, left her pregnant, and she has a super baby now. Even though Lois, I, was she married to somebody else? Or just yes, a, she was. Well, yeah, so basically Superman finked another man's wife and now isn't paying child support on her super kid. And granted, the reveal that the kid was super was kind of cool, but, you know, we, we, we've gone round and round to this. You know, people say, okay, married characters don't work. Giving kids character, giving kids to a single superhero doesn't work. I, you know, Incredibles, Fantastic Four, First Family. I'll buy that because the key is it's family. 
and you can work with it. But, you know, Superman with a kid, Batman with a kid. Yeah, okay, the Super Sons series was kind of fun. But this was just wrong in so many ways. And, you know, did Lois, I mean, did Lois, I mean, put two and two together? Oh, yeah, Superman slept with me and I got his kid. I mean, it didn't seem like she did. You know, between the ending and they jammed in the death, you know, 10 minutes before the credits and, uh, you know, Luther got away scot-free. And, you know, the thing with the, Kevin Spacey as Luther is he was not playing a friendly, jovial Luther. I mean, you could see Gene Wilder, uh, not Gene Wilder, Gene Hackman, he was a devious but kind of a goofy type Luther. You know, he just as soon cut a joke and then turn around and kill you the next time. Uh, but, yeah, this was just an evil Luther, and he should have been jailed by the end of the movie, at least bald, you know. And, yeah, no, they, they just kind of misfired on this. I know they, they launched into Man of Steel a number of years later. And, again, the, the guy I feel sorry for most is Brandon Ruth because he was a good Superman, just not a good movie. And of all the movies, you know, and, there, you know, there are movies where we sit down and we go, oh, that was bad. I was majorly disappointed in this because I was so excited for what it could have been. Uh, that's all I got to say about that. Corey? The movie I think is the worst superhero movie is, and you know, there were a lot that came out where you just went, oh, God, that's awful. But this was one that was high profile. It was, you know, they spent a lot of money promoting it. They had big money people in it, and it's unfucking watchable. And that's <laughs> Batman and Robin. I, I to this day, I still have no idea why I enjoyed it so much the first time I saw it. It had to be because we were with our good buddy Nick, and we were just laughing our ass off. Because I, I will I will sit back and let you go, but I will second the motion. I've watched this with my kids, and I don't know what the F I was thinking. I knew I was in trouble when in the opening sequence, I can't make heads or tails out of what the, what, what the hell the fight is. How Batman and Robin are flying, and then all of a sudden, in the middle of the fight, a hockey game breaks out. Pat nipples. It's unwatchable. Arnold Schwarzenegger who, you know, he could be a good muscle head. All he did in this was, you know, have terrible puns. Uma I Thurman. Used to see you. Uma Thurman, oh. who's a great actress, put me to sleep. I, this, this movie killed careers. Did you hear, just recently they were talking, apparently Schwarzenegger and, uh, who's Robin, Chris O'Donnell? Yeah. They never filmed together. No. Their scenes were filmed separate. Yeah. And, you know, it's subtle, but it shows now that you go back and try to look at it. And, and I did, I thought Bruce or George Clooney was a very personable Bruce Wayne. He looked like Bruce Wayne. He's the type of guy who should come out and women should be throwing their undies at him. Oh, but if you uh, watch it, you can tell he's very, he, he doesn't know how to act for the big screen yet because everything is smile, head bob, head bob, God, smile, God, head bob, smile, smile, head bob, head, head, bob. Bob, head bob, head bob. Um, if there for a while, if people would tell him how much they dislike the movie, he'd give their money back. Um, yeah. when they said they were going to put at least this movie, when they said they were going to put it, this movie out with commentary, the, one of the things Clooney says, well, if they're going to do director's commentary, the entire commentary should be the director just saying through the whole film, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry. I went and saw this movie with my son, who, you know, enamored of all things Batman. And, you know, after that opening sequence, I just lean over and go, do we have to watch this whole thing? Yes, it's Batman. I, it's the most painful movie experience I've ever had because it's poorly filmed. It looks ugly. It just looks terrible. The, the, the movie just, it looks like they vomited color up on the screen. The plot makes no sense whatsoever. And when, my, when I bought, you know, 
the four the four movie set, you know, with all the extras and everything, and you kind of had to get Batman and Robin with it. My son, of course, you know, watched them all when he he was, you know, like I don't know, twenty twenty one, and he came out of his room after watching it on his computer and said, "I'm so sorry I made you watch that." <laughs> he has yet to apologize for <laughs> the Spice Girls movie, but he apologized for that. And I've told this story a few times on the podcast, but DC. You know, for all the Batman movies, they would ramp up because they made phenomenal amounts of money with the first one. The second one they did okay with. The third one they did okay with. But they're finalizing all their plans. Okay, we're going to have Poison Ivy here. We're going to have Mr. Freeze here. We're going to have these specials. We're going to have trade paperbacks. So they had a special screening for the people at DC. And this was back when Denny O'Neill was in charge of the Batman books. So they have the screening, they show the movie, and when the lights come up, Denny O'Neill turns to all the people working on Batman and says, we're fucked. <laughs> we have tied our next year into this movie, and we're just fucked. People are going to hate this movie. They're not going to want anything to do with it. And he was right. The Poison Ivy stuff that they came out with didn't sell. The Mr. Freeze stuff they came out with didn't sell. You know, the Batman comic sold well because it was Batman at the time. But they got away from the tie-ins as quick as they could. Um, the movie is unwatchable. It's ugly. It's poorly filmed. And uh, Jesse Ventura yelled at me about it. <laughs> what did he say? Well, remember when he had his radio show? Yeah. There was one time I called in, and I wasn't being a jerk. I just called in and said, what was it like working on the set? Did you guys know that the movie was a mess and wasn't going to do well? Was there any indication while they were filming it? He took personal affront to, what do you mean? What do you mean it was terrible? What do you mean it was a bomb? Well, it didn't make its money back, and it killed the Batman franchise. And that doesn't mean it was a bad movie. He was personally offended that anyone would say that the movie was bad. And me, I just wanted a story because I imagine, you know, they're looking at the script and they're doing the movie and they're looking at the dailies going, God, this is a mess. But nope, they all thought it was a hit, I guess. You know who does put out a hit week after week after week, Joe? Wait, wait. Ah, I'm stumped. These guys, our sponsors. That's right, here at the Solitaire Rose Radio Network, we have ads, and our first sponsor is me. That's right, your charming and delightful old Uncle Rap Bastard. I have my first book out with Dangerous Dan Moore. It's the first hundred strips of our online web strip, Worldwide News, the story of the lowest-rated cable news network. And you can get yourself a copy with commentary, with all sorts of extras, with uh, signatures and everything. Just email Dan over at lordshadowflame at gmail.com. Our top sponsor, who's been with us since day one, is DreamHost. DreamHost.com. You need yourself a website, and DreamHost.com is the number one web host in the whole known universe. Just head over to DreamHost.com, put in the code CRAZY, K-R-A-Y-Z, get $20 off your first year. How can you beat that? Our other sponsor is Graze, G-R-A-Z-E.com. Healthy snacks for a healthy lifestyle. Just head over to Gray's, put in the code C-O-R-Y-S-3-R-5-P. Your first and fifth box are free. You can get them weekly. You can get them bi-weekly. You can get them monthly. You can just order a whole bunch of them. It's great stuff to keep you away from the vending machine at work. Now, if you would like to leave a comment for any of the podcasts that we do, we'd love those. Go ahead and email us at solitairerosenetwork at gmail.com or you can call 952-856-0519. Operators are standing by. Okay, it's just a place that will record your calls, but we'll play them on the air. We'll answer your questions. We love getting feedback. Tell us what you think. Ask a question. Suggest a topic. Be a guest. Send us your stuff. Solitaire Rose Network at gmail.com. If you would like to advertise on any of the Solitaire Rose radio shows, you can. Just email us at Solitaire Rose Network at gmail.com. Subject advertising. Thanks. And they're not the only ones knocking it out of the park. You know who else is knocking it out of the park every week? Uh, these guys are cool podcasters. That's right. 
The Solitaire Rose Radio Network has all sorts of podcasts. We've got Scrabbling Across the West with Dave Caffell and his lovely bride, Stephanie. They travel across the country playing uh, musical gigs, and at night they sit down to play Scrabble and talk about their day at scrabbling.solitairerose.com. There's Novelcast over at novels.solitairerose.com, where I take the novels that I've written and turn them into audio podcasts. Currently, we are doing a novel called Do the Job, which is a murder mystery set in the world of 1980s professional wrestling. Then over at badadvice.solitairerose.com, me, Corey Strode, and Wolfie B. Bad, along with Dan Moore, give bad advice to people who send in questions. That's bad advice over at badadvice.solitairerose.com. The Solitaire Rose Radio Network is growing. Be there! You think NBC will get mad I used that? And now that we've got all the plugs out of the way, we get to it the most important. didn't Im- study. <laughs> now, now, now we're at the most important part of the show, Joe's favorite part of the show. It's where Corey talks about what he needs to throw away in the fridge. Mm-hmm. No, no, no. It's uh, what's going on on the Ebays, Joe? Well, as I said before, we're, we're winding up for the uh, MSP Comic Con 2018, part of the charity booth stuff. I have been getting donations, in, which is pretty cool. Uh, one guy I want to uh, shout out, uh, C Car Solar, who sells uh, Hot Wheels, convention cars, collector sets, things like that. If, you, if you're interested, you can find him at C Car Solar on the toypeddler.com. You can contact him at ccarsolar at comcast.net or uh, uh, I can, you can even uh, call me on his cell phone if you want. He, uh, he every so often he opens up his garage and he kind of blows out his cards because you know as you as you're picking up stuff he's just been doing uh, uh, you know it, it tends to build up. It, it's probably never happened to you Corey but uh, you know it, it happens. I actually uh, emailed him ahead of time and I'm, I'm looking through my my bags of stuff because Hot Wheels just came out with a uh, uh, set of they call them their uh, memorial cars, and this one it's cool because it's all Alex Ross art. You got Alex Ross on a Superman car. There's Batman. Uh, they got Green Lantern, Wonder Woman, and then of course uh, the JLA. And if you like Alex Ross art or you like the Hot Wheels, these are some solid collector items and of course they're almost impossible to find because as soon as they hit the hooks at your local stores they're gone so he put a set together for me um i also picked up the uh uh collector version of the yellow submarine which had a little bit more detail a little bit more heavy than your than your regular run i mentioned this because he donated a huge box of stuff and i've been going through it and just wowed by the uh the generosity that he had. And this is the second year in a row he's he's uh, donated stuff. And again, if you've got things you want to donate, be it a graphic novel stinker or you happen to, you know, invest heavy on, on DVDs of Superman Returns and Batman and Robins, we'll take them at the charity booth auction and we'll donate them off. Uh, what does that have to do with eBay? Well, as things are selling, and they are, last five things I sold, uh, there's a book from uh, Aspen called uh, Journey, at G- J-I-R-N-I. I'm not quite sure what it's about, but uh, they had a bunch of Only for One comics, and uh, the source donated one that happened to be uh, signed by J.T. Kroll, one of the creators, and I put it on the Ebays and sold it for the charity auction. Uh, sold a couple Brave and Bolds, 100 pager, 112 and 116. They were in good to very good shape, Good readers, you know, talked in the past about how I read that. IDW, I had a set of the Doctor Who classics, the seventh Doctor, one through five out of 2011. And out of the Shazam run that I I was boasting about, I've actually sold a couple of those. I sold a Shazam 16, which was the uh, 100 pager, uh, came out in 74. It's only a good copy, so it went kind of cheap. I uh, so I saw <laughs> I showed the Shazam. It's You're sure, Shazam, sure? I'm I'm sure sure I did that. Corey, what is significant about Shazam number fifteen, nineteen seventy four hundred pager? Wasn't it the first hundred pager? Uh no. Oh, then I don't know. 
I have not read that series. It, it, it may have been, but no, this actually had uh, Earth One Luther get zapped into a comic book, and he walks around totally befuddled on Earth S, uh, looking at all the cartoon villains. And eventually, he decides to go back, and he's relieved until Superman grabs him by the shoulder and arrests him. So this is classic Earth One stuff, bald headed Luther. Kind of fun. It's a pricier book because of the the weird crossover. And uh, I, again, I had one that was just in very good shape, so sold it as a reader copy. I sold the Shazam number twenty five, which we've talked about before, because it's the first appearance of Isis. Mine was only in fine shape, so it didn't really go for the the mint run, which is upwards in the hundred dollar range. And the last one I sold was a good copy of Shazam number thirty which is the first time the entire Marvel family is in an actual story. Uh, we talked about Shazam 28 that had the first Bronze Age appearance of uh, Black Adam, but he actually appears in one of the 100 pages because they ran him one of his, his origin stories from the Golden Age. So that's actually kind of his uh, kind of a interesting tidbit. Most of the other Shazams are there waiting for you to go, and I'm always adding stuff. Stuff will be disappearing, though, because as I get ready to get closer to FallCon, I'm going to start put, pulling this stuff out and bringing it to the charity booth. So if there's something you're interested in that you'd like to take a closer look at, give me a call. I'll bring it to the charity booth for you, and I'll donate everything to the two charities we're working with. Uh, if you just want to take it home for your own greedy self, and boy, I understand that. Make an offer. Let me know you listen to the show. I'll, I'll give you something fun. I'll ship it to you for free. Maybe I'll uh, give you a twofer or something. I got tons of stuff to give away. I got a lot of comics to give. Oh, by the way, K-R-A-Y-Z, crazy. That's where you'll find me. Well, now we get to my favorite part of the show. No, 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 not where I turn off the microphone and start playing old video games from the 70s. Oh, that could be fun. It's a freaking a geeking. Joe, what are you freaking on? Oh, I, I've just I've just been achy. It's been kind of a busy day at work and and uh You work just, today? Well, I feel like I did. Uh I'll, I'll get to the part of the work I did was in the geeking, but uh I uh I got a a little ding in my uh truck's windshield happened during the snow last weekend and uh I had uh, the rider get it and for the windshield, so they'll come out and replace it for free. And I got up this morning, and I'm waiting for them, and then I realized oh, they're coming in on Tuesday. So I got to get up early tomorrow. Uh, on my allergy update, uh, I went in, and uh, I, I, I don't know how, what I covered the last time. If uh, I think I think I did I cover everything about the grid test and the uh, yes. the gallon of blood and the pee yeah no I haven't heard anything although works now like hey what are you allergic to don't know it probably wasn't work related it just happened at work so now I'm worried if they're gonna say well you know we're not gonna pay for your ambulance right and I said oh that's good did you do it when uh, Brad had a heart attack and you you know you know all that fatty food you've been eating had nothing to do with work we're not gonna pay for it so whatever I'm insured we'll figure it out. Uh, other than that, uh, not really freaking on too much. I, 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 I'm going to revisit the freaking when I get to the geeking because there's some, you know, every so often you have something that you're geeking on, but there's a little freak attached to it. But we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Corey, what are you freaking on? Attached? There is. What's his name? I, he passed away. Don't worry about it. Um, did, did, one of the DC miniseries that is out now that I was going to pick up as a trade paperback, Batman White Knight. Guess what, Joe? What? It's the start of a new DC uh, imprint. <laughs> um, D D DC has so many different imprints now that I've given up keeping track. Yeah. And it's a stupid idea. It's a stupid idea because the, the, the way mainstream comic fans buy their stuff is they want to buy books that quote matter unquote it doesn't matter if the book's good it doesn't matter if they enjoy it it's does it matter does it have consequences does it tie in with the universe well if they start doing all these books that have their own universes eventually people don't care i'm looking at new you new bleh. i'm looking at you new universe marvel 2099 <laughs> 
Ultimate Universe. Uh, you know, what uh, what was a Marvel UK? When you start splitting up your line into a whole bunch of little mini lines, no one cares, and sales drop. But uh, DC seems to be uh, going down that path, and I don't understand why. The other thing, Box Day is uh, probably like late next week. Mm -hmm. Because oh, it previews is going to be in. Previews is going to be in, so we'll have all your books by Tuesday night. When am I? When are you going to mail them? Uh, next Monday. And there are no omnibuses. There were no omnibuses. Out of all the omnibuses I've ordered, none shipped in April. None. The closest thing to an omnibus was the uh, third volume of the Planet of the Apes uh, archives, which reprints the Marvel Black and White magazine. And the way they publish that is really weird. It's like, okay, here's the serial. That was a continuation after the last Planet of the Apes movie. That's all in one book. Now here are all the short stories in another book, and now here's all the adaptations in in a third book. Rather than okay, here's issues one through ten, here's uh, eleven through twenty, and here's twenty through the end of the end of the run. So that's a little weird too. But no omnibuses. I'm sad. And he has a hole in his wall. And wolves are after him. Really? I thought it was just Wolfie after me, but I've been able to get rid of him with uh, a, a note from the HR department. <laughs> so uh, that's really all I'm geeking on. Joe, I'm freaking on. Joe, what are you geeking on? Oh, the new Lost in Space is amazing. I've heard it's very good. It is. When you're ready, uh, just sit down and enjoy it. Because they, first of all, get the old one out of your brain, and uh, just that won't be hard. Because I hate yeah, the old I one. I never watched the old one. <laughs> I liked the book that Bill Mummy did at the very end, where he tied he finished the innovation series. I haven't seen hide nor hair of it anywhere, so it obviously must be a collector's item. But that was the closest they ever came to actually having a serious loss in space. And uh, I'm real excited about this one. And, uh, you know, Chris and I are deciding. She was, she's still not sure about it because it was way more intense than she was led to believe. And uh, I, I've got the one thing that I, I realize is missing is because they do have a family dynamics, but they don't have uh, the, the uh, they have the dad, they have Will, the two sisters, and the mom, but they don't have the Matt, major Matt. Or whatever his name, the, the the other guy that was there. Oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't really notice that until, uh, you know, I started thinking about it. It's like well, they're they're missing somebody. Oh yeah, that's who they're missing. But who knows? The character might show up later. The way it's set up, I don't want to say too much because it's a brand new series. I don't want to be doing the spoilers. Some uh, reading wise, uh, first off, if you get to your comic book store, they have a free Marvel Universe magazine. A type that either goes up or down in value depending on what appears. But what's fun is they get they talk about Avengers One, they give you a little sneak peek of Captain America One. They talk about Fantastic Four coming up. Talk about some of the collected editions. There's some house ads for some of the other books. Some of them I'm kind of like, no, why didn't you give me more about Amazing Spider-Man One instead of an interview? Uh, but this is the type of thing that you definitely want to get because they're apparently getting rid of all the legacy numbering and starting out with number ones. And this is a great way to, uh, especially if you're not going to buy previews or pick up the Marvel thing, to uh, kind of get your feet wet and see if any of these books are interesting. And some of them just by by kind of just looking at it, like the Life of Captain Marvel number one, uh, I actually, uh, they just show a couple, some of the art and some of the covers. And I'm like, you know, I might, I might have to pick up that. Even the Hulk one looks, the Immortal Hulk is... Uh, uh, I don't know. It's, it's looking creepy. I might have to give that a try. Uh, as far as actual comics read, I, I my daughter came up to me and last Wednesday said, uh, let's go to the source. Okay. So I got there and I, I decided, uh, since I, you know, I got a lot of stuff coming in box day, but I did pick me up an Action Comics 100 because I wanted to read it. And 100? I, wow. That's a back issue. That costs a, a lot of money. Oh wow! There's a piece of dirt on it. One thousand. Oh, wow. Okay. 
Oh, and here I was all excited. I thought it said 1918, but no, it's 2018. I enjoyed this. I, I like the short stories. It gives a chance to see some of the artists uh, shine. You get a good uh, Dan Jurgens story. There was a, a really cool one where they took, I think, pencils from Kurt Swan and uh, had Marv Wolfman script it. I don't know if this was uh, something that was never published or just they pulled out of the woodworks. Uh, there was a, a couple other interesting ones. I'm just kind of flipping through it. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Nope, nope, that wasn't it. Oh, Golden Age Superman talking to, I would imagine, the gentleman who uh, happened to be in that unlucky car that he held over his head in Action Comics number one cover. Just little things like that. I just enjoyed it. The Brian Michael Bendis story that had Jim Lee pencils, uh, it's a teaser. I was a little disappointed. I was hoping for a done in one, but it kind of is, you know, to be revealed in Man of Steel. So, you know, that's coming uh, in just a couple weeks. Uh, one week, I guess. No, about a month from now, I guess, by, as the podcast drops. So that I was a little disappointed in, just get, get a little taste but uh, not enough to make me go, oh, I am so excited for this. But the Action Comics one was fantastic. The only thing they could have done that would have been cooler is had they uh, actually put all the variant covers in the on the back or somewhere. Just enjoy it. Because I have the Dan Jurgens one coming on Box Day. I picked the Steve Rude one up, 1930s variant cover. If the book wasn't $7.99 a pop, I would probably pick up some other ones just for the, the art on the cover because it was a lot of fun. You know, I love me the omnibuses. Close behind is the complete editions. And I found I have the complete editions of Terry Moore's Echo. And uh, I was able to read the entire thing over the course of a week. It was a, a very exciting story. Really cool. Uh, the gist of the story is, is that uh, a woman's out taking pictures when suddenly an explosion happens above her. And all these little tiny pebble things come and land on her and uh, they suddenly attack her and she wakes up and discovers she has this immovable breastplate of this metal on her body and that's the first issue and it goes on from there to figure out where it's going it kind of a cross between science fiction and and adventure it does tie into the strangers in paradise universe i'm a little disappointing in the in the ending of it because it's one of these things that there's a lot of things in the air. There's a lot of people involved. Uh, the I suppose I, I can say that the good guys do save the day, considering there is a Strangers in Paradise 2 series coming out. And had the you know world ended, there probably wouldn't be a Strange in Paradise 2. But it just it seemed rushed towards the end. It's almost like, okay, I got one issue to finish everything. A lot of open questions. A lot of, uh, you know, had all these these players involved. And of course, this is you know government conspiracy and cons corporate conspiracies, and none of that's really attended to towards the end, at least not to my satisfaction. So I was a little disappointed in the ending, but uh, reading through it, I mean Terry Moore, I love his art. It was just very exciting. Speaking of exciting and really wild, I dug up because I haven't read it in a long time. Earth X, and when Earth X is really, how, what would you say, Corey? Kind of like a a real negative dy dysto am I saying it right dystopian view of the Marvel universe? Yes. And it's it was hard reading, but then again, so is Kingdom Come, but it's fun reading. And if you're someone who knows his Marvel minutia, you'll probably appreciate this more than somebody who doesn't. And you might reject the premise that Alex Ross is is giving in Earth X, but then again, it's Earth X. It's a potential different universe. And of course, Earth X goes into it's uh, what, Universe X and then Paradise X? No, nope, Universe X. Oh, Universe X is, yeah, Universe yeah. X and then Paradise X. And that's the freaking, because guess which book is out of print? Uh, that would be the middle one, Universe X. No, nope, those, I don't know, I have those, so I don't, but Paradise X. Volume uh, 1 is available, Volume 2 is not. And to compound the freaking is, I talked about it, uh, when uh, the I believe they're doing an omnibus of all of them. Yes. And I did uh, two volume omnibus. 
And I decided not to order it because I thought, well, I'll just pick up the used ones. There are no used ones to pick up. I have plenty of number ones, none of volume two to be found, except there are a few guys that are selling the whole run for like hundreds of bucks. So I may have to give a call to discount and say, hey, I know it's late. Can you put me on one of these Omnibuy? And then I'll sell Earth X and Universe X on the uh, the Ebays, or maybe I'll just drag them to the Falcon. So I was a little bummed about that. Chris is happy though. You you want a freaking or a, a geeking from Chris? Sure. Okay. What well, starts out as a freaking is apparently the bottom of our bathroom sink, the the trap. Uh, it's a well, trap. Uh, it's not anymore. It's a leak. And one thing, if you remember anything about plumbing, is that you need the trap there because it, it gets water in it and it keeps sewer gas from coming up and getting into your room, be it your laundry room or your bathroom or your kitchen or wherever the water is because the gas doesn't go through the water. Well, if the trap's gone, the gas can now, if there's any, can come up into the sink. Fortunately, because of the cool weather we've been having, it hasn't really, you know, percolated up. But uh, where the geeking comes in is I spent most of the afternoon, which is why I'm so freaking achy, uh, yeah, I only took about four trips back and forth to the plumbing store, and I was able to uh, get the trap. And the the unfortunately, when I was trying to remove it from the kitchen sink, all the pipes just kind of shredded, and they're metal. And you're thinking, what the? Okay, yeah, this house is from the late twenties, and probably nothing's been done on these pipes in at least mid eighties when we bought the damn thing. So I ran, I replaced the pipes, it ran me a whole job other than four trips hour and a half about 20 bucks so what what was really freaking me though and i if, if there is a god i'm in big ass trouble because i think i invented about 20 different swear words as i was trying to put this shit together because the pipes are about a quarter inch shorter than they are in other words you, you buy the stuff at the at the uh, uh plumbing store and it's all pretty yeah it's all standard should fit no this the idiot who put this sink in, just like my toilet. I don't know if I ever told the, to the story about trying to replace my toilet. But they're all the wrong size for the room he did. The, the guy who owned the house ahead of me must have just slapped things together. Because we found the weirdest shit in the electrical. We found weirdest things in the plumbing. And it just creates a freaking headache. Uh, I, I don't know if I, I went through the whole... Uh, $700 storyline of me trying to fix my bathtub. So for me to spend $20 and finally be able to fix this and fix it so it's not going to leak is actually quite an accomplishment. So I'm putting that down into geeking. Not to mention, Chris was fairly impressed. So that's pretty much all I, I've been doing. Corey, what, you, what you'll be geeking on? Uh, yeah, first thing I am geeking on, uh, Joe, you know, we just had the, uh, the, 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 uh, the WrestleMania, right? I does. Have you watched it yet? No, I did read up on it, so I do know what happened. Well, guess what? There's a sequel this this Friday. Oh. They're calling it the Greatest Royal Rumble. What it is, WWE has signed this uh, multi-year deal with Saudi Arabia that they will be putting on super shows in Saudi Arabia, which is kind of a big deal because, you know, Saudi Arabia didn't allow... Um, movie theaters and now they're having movie theaters the new the new king is kind of opening up to um outside entertainment they're going to have movie theaters and the wwe is coming there and they're going to fill a stadium and uh, i don't even want to get into all the details of the deal if you want that go over to pwinsider.com but this is a very big deal for wwe so they are having the greatest royal rumble it'll be a royal rumble with 50 participants you're getting uh, triple h versus john cena you're getting a rematch of roman reigns and brock lesnar in a steel cage you're getting all sorts of you know huge matches None of the women have matches, by the way. They're not going. No, not in Saudi Arabia. No, not in Saudi Arabia. No, not but uh, it starts at like 10 in the afternoon on uh, Friday and goes, you know, probably for like, I don't know, five, six hours. But uh, I, I'll be at work, but it does mean that I have my Sunday after my Sunday off. I can sit down at around noon and just... Uh, 
take the entire afternoon and watch this uh, big old wrestling show. And the Royal Rumble is always my favorite match of the year. And this year I won't have to type up what's happening like I did at the uh, other Royal Rumble. So I'm excited about that. I like that WWE is putting more of these special events on the network. You, you, you $9.99 a month, man. Uh, Comic-wise, I am all caught up on Dan Slott's Spider-Man as he's building to issue 800. And uh, this story is phenomenal. It, uh, for the longest time, you know, you and I have talked about when Norman Osborn shows up, Spider-Man should just want to beat the piss out of him. Yeah. They've, I'm still not going to say that it's worth it to bring Norman Osborn back because I think it was one of the dumbest things Marvel ever did. Dumber than one more day. Bringing on Norman Osborn back was a terrible idea. But since they did it, this is the best Norman Osborn story since um, the Dark Reign. Norman Osborn is a crazy, angry villain, much like he was during the 60s. And I'm loving this story. Um, during Marvel's uh, 99 cent sale, I picked up the digital version of the Avengers Defenders War. So I have been reading that on my Kindle. And this was Steve Englehart kind of, you know, doing whatever he felt like. And the build-up to the Avengers Defenders War is so much fun. There's so much soap opera stuff going on. Um, and the war itself, you know, the plot is very standard. I think every superhero where, you know, teams fight each other, there's a MacGuffin that's split into a bunch of parts, and the different teams have to go find all the parts. But this is kind of the first story where that happened, so you can kind of forgive it. But it's just an excuse for Thor to fight the Hulk. You know, it's just an excuse for heroes to fight each other. And I, this was before I was reading comics, but reading this, I'm 12 years old again going, oh, wow, Thor and Hulk are going to punch the shit out of each other. This is going to be great. <laughs> and then the last thing I am geeking on, um, there are rumors floating. Rumors, Joe. And after hearing some of these rumors, DC, you've been listening to our podcast again, stealing ideas from us. Because mm -hmm. uh, remember how we talked about Dream Teams? Oh, yeah. Do you remember who I said should take over Green Lantern? Yes. Grant Morrison is rumored to be taking over Green Lantern. <sighs> Bastards are stealing our ideas again. Yeah. yeah they were just, and you know, we, we wouldn't mind if you just throw a couple preview copies our way. Because you, know, you know we do that too. We're not asking for much. We we just want to wet our beak a little. Just you know, send us, put us on the on the press mailing list. Throw us an interview or two. Just let us wet our beak a little. You know, we're giving you this stuff for free. Just you know, it it worst comes to worst, it, it, switch your host, switch DC's hosting over to DreamHost.com. Let us wet our beak a little, man. Come on, yeah. man. Yeah. Believe it or not, kids, you've listened to us blather on about funny books and superhero movies for an hour and a half. And we could have been at the Infinity War premiere red carpet, which is going on even as we do this podcast. But by the time you listened to it, it would have been a week ago. We were invited? No, but we could have gone. I, I read Jim Starlin, who three hours beforehand was standing in his hotel room in his underwear, talking about how weird it was that you know, he's standing in his hotel room in his underwear, and in three hours, he's going to see all his ideas up on a big screen. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> and as we say every week, the comic we like the least, we still like better than the comic that you like the most. Joe? Don't let anyone ever make you feel like you don't deserve what you want. Hit my music. 